Hi guys. It is a blah winter day here in the drought plagued wasteland of South Austin, Texas. We have made it to Monday morning, January 7th, 2013. The first Monday morning of 2013 as I crank up my regular Monday morning feature here on Humpty Dumpty Tribe, the, my weekly economic meltdown roundup where I go on the mainstream media right here on the Yahoo News page and, and graze through the mainstream media to see what a uh, line of crap is being fed to the American people about the state of the U.S. and the global economy and the vast majority of it, make no mistake about it, that all is rosy. Uh, it's just, just business as usual and the endless uh, no limit uh, economic growth model, but uh, even on the mainstream media there's always a few little voices of dissent uh, squeaking about what the truth is. Uh, now there of course there's the, the real doomsdayers, you know, Max Kaiser uh, predicting total economic collapse uh, in April and, 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 and that brand of doomsday profits are, they, they don't get any voice in the mainstream media, but a few of these guys get in. And so just as last week at my, on my last uh, economic roundup of 2012, I looked back over the year 2012. So this week, what I'm going to do is check in with uh, six doomsday prophets uh, as we look forward towards 2013 uh, to what we can expect uh, in the economy, I guess planet-wide, but particularly here in the United States of America. This is what you can expect according to these six economists who assumedly know a hell of a lot more about the subject than some dumb hippie on a rock. Uh, I, I admit, guys, uh, I'm trying to figure out this convoluted mess through all of the disinformation, the, uh, the flat-out flat lying sacks of shit out there, the political spins, the wishful thinking, and... Uh, so anyway, these are six guys who know a hell of a lot more about it than me, and so this is what they have to say. And of course, I want to start off uh, today's uh, roundup of economic doomsayers with everybody's mainstream media favorite. Uh, and this guy is actually named Dr. Doom, this fellow Rubini. This is off of CNBC this morning. Uh, Rubini, Rubini, despite despite deal, U.S. will quote soon get messy. All right, uh, this is what is this guy's name? Nuri L. N O U R I E L. Rubini, R O U B I N E B I N I. Uh, this is him. Uh, this is actually an opinion piece in the Financial Times. So this uh, Nouriel Rubini, Dr. Doom, uh, tech, who he really is, is chairman of Rubini Global Economics. Okay, he has been dubbed Dr. Doom for his gloomy economic forecast. And so, staying uh, true to form, uh, Rubini is uh, saying that this uh, joke of a uh, of a fiscal cliff deal, yeah, right. That this kicking the can down uh, the road about a half a block. When was that on New Year's Eve? That horseshit deal. Uh, this is according to him. The deal manages to stave off the debt issue temporarily rather than resolve it while another serious battle over raising the debt ceiling looms. 
at the end of February, the U.S. government will reach its debt limit and an agreement is needed between Republicans and Democrats for an increase to the debt ceiling. Now, as I reported last week, uh, Geithner was saying the U.S. was going to hit its debt ceiling on December 31st, a week ago, but he said we could probably squeak by uh, for a couple of months. And what he was referring to this, we we're really going to have to face uh, this uh, in a couple of months. All right. Let's see. Rubini said in the article, quote, it won't be long before there is another crisis. Two months, in fact. That is only the beginning. Later in 2013, a bigger debate on medium-term fiscal consolidation will begin. He added that, quote, a big fight about entitlements should be expected as well, uh, and as well as a series of little fights over tax reforms, and the whole process will likely soon get messy. Uh, okay, uh, see, in the piece, Rubini said that the fiscal adjustment would translate as a drag on the U.S. economy during the year, warning, quote, the U.S. could quite easily come per perilously close to stall speed this year, close quote, or worse if things over there in Europe don't get any better. Uh, he goes further to argue the longer term is likely to be much worse than any of these short-term woes. Okay, so anyway, uh, let's see. Quote, it will probably take years for the U.S. to confront the reality of its fiscal position. Large fiscal deficits will remain the norm for the next few years as long as the bond market remains quiet, as I believe it will. Um, and it finishes, last quote here, quote, the mini deal on the fiscal cliff dodged all the important questions. By not including the spending cuts in that deal, the Democrats have emboldened the Republicans. It is again up to Washington's policymakers to fix the problem before the market does it for them. Okay, and he warns that this will not happen with any ease. I'm going to, as I do every week, I will put a link to all of these stories so you can go, because, you know, I'm just, I, I just skip through them. Uh, so for, you can, for all these complete stories, you can go on these individual links. Uh, okay, so that's so much for Mr. Rubini. Let's see, as I say, I've got six of these. Uh, well, let's, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stab blindly at my six uh, economists here. Okay, this one from uh, The Exchange, uh, titled, <clears throat> How the Budget Deal Will Push Up Unemployment, and this is from a an economist named Peter Morisi. Peter Morisi is an economist and professor at the Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. And this is what Peter Morisi, uh, his article is looking, you know, analyzing this joke of a fiscal cliff deal and uh, his reading of it is that unemployment will actually get worse because of this, and this is his logic for that. Uh, okay, Friday forecasters uh, expect the Labor Department to report the economy at 155,000 jobs in December. Uh, you know, how many rants have I had on these BS uh, 
unemployment numbers. Okay, uh, this 155,000 jobs is substantially less than is needed to pull unemployment down to acceptable levels. Uh, Let's see, the tax and spending package passed by the Senate and House, although there was no spending package passed uh, last week, as I just mentioned, uh, provides little prospects of improvement as the U.S. economy continues to suffer from insufficient demand and will continue growing at a subpar 2% this year. Well, we'll see. Uh, Factors contributing to weak demand and slow jobs creation are the huge trade deficits with China uh, and other Asians. I've uh, I mentioned that, that these trade deficits is in Iran a couple of days ago about how lopsided that are and, and, and of course oil, how that's going to play out. Uh, that's on the demand side and on the supply side, increased business regulations, rising health care costs and mandates imposed by Obamacare and now higher taxes on small businesses discourage investment that raise productivity and competitiveness and create jobs. So higher Social Security payroll taxes. Uh, you can look forward to that. Uh, there you go. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see. Uh, at, at some point, I, I thought this was going to be about uh, how this was going to raise un unemployment. Okay. Uh, these higher taxes on small businesses will re reduce returns on investment. This will slow capital spending and new hiring in 2013 and even more in 2014. Uh, at least small businesses now have more certainty because so now they have the assurance of more burdensome regulations, health care costs, and taxes, all which will burden growth. Uh, okay, the economy must add more than 356,000 jobs every month for the next three years to lower unemployment to 6%, and that's not likely to happen. No shit. Uh, it is simply not going to happen. Uh, most analysts see the unemployment rate inching up uh, in the, you know, coming up. Uh, the wild card is the number of adults actually working or seeking jobs. How, how, many, how many times have I gone through these horse shit unemployment numbers? So this is according to Peter Marisi. Uh, labor force partic participation is lower today than when Obama took office and the quote recovery began and factoring in discouraged adults and others working in part-time jobs that would prefer full-time work according to this Marisi dude the unemployment rate for this country is 14.4 percent according to his analysis and if you and if you got down there in the alternative media you would see those doom and gloomers saying the uh, the real unemployment rate in this country is around 21 percent okay but again i will uh, uh also the likelihood of a downgrade in the u.s credit rating by moody's is increasing and this, too, will weigh on the investment plans of many U.S. multinational corporations. There you go, which is, you know, is going to weigh down job growth over there in China. Since uh, it's not going to, these U.S. multinational corporations doesn't have much effect on, uh, on, on actual U.S. workers because the workers working for these multinational corporations based in the U.S. are working in China, if you guys haven't realized that. 
that uh, the, the probably the single major reason for the unemployment rate in this country, be it 7%, 14%, or 21%, is that all the jobs moved to China a few years ago. Okay, that was Peter Marisi. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's stab here to Doomsday Prophet number three. This is again from CNBC, uh, market rad rally, quote, totally misplaced, scary February ahead. All right, and who is fellow saying this? Uh, the market rally currently taking hold is, quote, totally misplaced. And February's looming debt ceiling, which I just mentioned, could bring a very scary surprise, one strategist told CNBC. So who is this strategist? This is a fellow named Nicholas Spiro. So Nicholas Spiro is the managing director at Spiro Sovereignty Sovereign Strategy. Okay, quote, this rally shows just how low we have sunk in investor expectations when the, ma when the market rallies just on muddling through. I disagree completely with those who argue that most of the uncertainty has been lifted. Okay, Spiro warned that the looming debt ceiling in late February or early March when the U.S. government will reach its borrowing limit and another deal will be needed to raise the debt ceiling could bring a, quote, very scary surprise. Quote, I believe, and, and, and I'm agreeing with this guy, I, I, I believe that the Republicans will fall into line at the 11th hour as they have already caved in uh, over a relatively minor piece, meaning uh, that fiscal cliff joke. Uh, but it will be extremely messy, and there should be a lot of volatility expected before then, he said. Uh, he says that the U.S. has already fallen off a fiscal cliff because of its dysfunctional political system. Quote, it's, been, it's fallen off the political cliff, but it's been tumbling for a while. This is a political system that is knee-deep in partisan warfare. House Speaker John Boner has lost control of his troops. And there you go. Sparrow said it was only now that investors uh, are coming to grips with the severity of dysfunction that characterizes the U.S. political system. Uh, okay, which is a perfect segue into this, uh, into this next uh, economic doomsday prophet who are commenting on how the, this unbelievable infighting in Washington, D.C., this Keystone Cops little game going over there on Washington, D.C., how, it, you know, uh, it, it's unbelievable that the U.S. economy is afloat at all with these idiots uh, running the show up there in Washington. So we're going uh, back uh, to Breakout, uh, an article titled... Nothing but battles lie ahead for the new Congress. Yeah, what else? What else is new uh, since uh, 1776, right up to 2013? Uh, now this is going to be, I guess, some fellow name. <coughs> based on an interview uh, with Ed Mills. Ed Mills is a Washington-based senior policy analyst for FBR Capital. 
Okay. Uh, it was simply known as battle fatigue during World War II. Uh, but n I, uh, which is nothing more than the sudden inability to fight anymore. But today in Washington, despite a bruising presidential race and a two-month tangle over the fiscal cliff, lawmakers are anything but fatigued. In fact, they seem recharged and ready to go at it again and again and again. And uh, so this is what uh, this fellow Ed Mills quote, we're headed to another showdown. Brinksmanship is going to be the name of the game, meaning in 2013, and it's not going to be pretty. Mills is talking about what he calls the quote, triple witching hour that lawmakers will have to face in the next three months as they try to simultaneously, number one, prevent the U.S. from defaulting on his debt, number two, from getting hit with across-the-board spending cuts, three, all against the backdrop of preventing the U.S. government from shutting down, y you know, uh, why don't we just let the damn government shut down Jesus? Uh, quote, neither side is going to try to get this done early, uh, said Mills, adding he doesn't, quote, have a lot of hope for a huge grand compromise over the debt ceiling, spending cuts, or the continuing resolution. Uh, there you go. Uh, as much as Americans are fed up with Congress's endless bickering, Mills says, quote, there are a lot of conservative lawmakers who were very burnt during this last process, close quote, and they're prepared to take us over the cliff by any means necessary. Uh, we, we averted the fiscal cliff by sounding more and more like uh, by a couple of months and we can get back to this whole damn fiscal cliff crap. Uh, all right, good Lord, where, where was I at? Is that three down? Let's go on to, is that four down? How many have I already done here? I guess I've already done, uh, I guess I've done four. Let's, so we're going to head to number five. This is from uh, The Street by, a, by an economist named Richard Suttmeyer writing for The Street. Now, I have no Richard Suttmeyer Neither Richard Suttmeyer nor The Street really gives this guy's qualifications, but I guess if he has enough qualifications to be writing for The Street, he has more qualifications than a dumb hippie sitting on a rock. So whoever this guy is, since he doesn't care to identify himself, uh, is this is what he has to say about 10 themes for the new millennium teen years, starting with 2013. Okay, the teenage years of the new millennium will be difficult for investors, businesses, Wall Street, Main Street, retirees, the healthcare network, the housing market, and the bank system. There you go. We will be in a prolonged period where Americans will have to adjust to a lower standard of living. There you go. Stocks are overvalued, making stock picking an important art to learn. And this is not just over uh, 2000. This is, I guess, looking at the next six, next six years. Uh, so in this environment, I continue to believe in a buy and trade investment strategy. Uh, 
Let's see, and we're, we're all waiting next week when the fourth quarter earnings are posted. Uh, where we, more and more of these economists are are saying we're going to get our reality check next week with these fourth quarter earnings. But I guess I'll save that for next week's rant. Uh, so anyway, he gets down to the ten themes for the teenage years of the new millennium. And, uh, and again, I'll put a link. I'm just going to touch on them, and, and you can go on to this if you want to find a deeper analysis. Okay, number one, the housing recovery will remain sluggish in 2013. Number two, the rebound in home prices will slow. Number three, the upside for money center and regional bank stocks will be limited in 2013. Number four, community banks will continue to fail in 2013. Number five, consumer confidence will remain below neutral in this year. Number six, the low yield environment for 10 year treasury notes will continue. Seven, the bubble in COMEX gold will not reinflate. Number eight, the bubble in NYMEX crude oil will not reinflate. Number nine, the euro versus the dollar will maintain its trading range. Number 10, the stock market is a risky asset class in 2013. A risky asset class. And then he breaks this way on down. This article go, goes on and on and on uh, in, in his predictions for 2013. And I encourage you to, uh, to read these uh, in the link that I'll provide. And okay, let's do one more. This is also from the street. Uh, this is a fellow, Chris C. No, I'm sorry. That's just a normal. This is this is a fellow, uh, Byron Ween. I guess W I E N, an economist named Byron Ween or Wine. Uh, he is the vice chairman of Blackstone advisory partners and this is also published uh, out of the street uh, now this guy the, the headline of, of this is 2013 predictions the S&P 500 plunges while gold soars uh, now uh, before I even get into this I, I will uh, I will let you know that his predictions for gold and assumedly silver soaring in 2013, uh, as a player in the silver market myself, uh, I will make it make it clear that he is probably in the minority. That the majority of soothsayers are saying gold and silver could tank uh, this coming up year. Gold and silver, at least, is exactly where it was a year ago. It's been no change in the past year. We'll see. But uh, I'm getting off track here. So anyway, so some of his predictions for 2013 are up. Some of them are down. It's a mixed bag. Uh, okay, among some of the more notable macro calls Ween makes are concerns over oil prices. He believes the price of West Texas Intermediate could plunge on new rules out of uh, Washington. Uh, okay, but he's bullish on Chinese stocks and gold. He sees gold reaching $1,900 this year. Okay, so below is the entire list of weans. This is his 10 predictions for 2013, and again, uh, you can go on to, I'm just going to touch on them real quick to close this rant. Okay, uh, number one, Iran announces it has adequate enriched uranium to produce a nuclear-armed 
missile and the International Atomic Energy Agency confirms this claim and uh, good lord if that does happen I mean the unbelievable fallout from that uh, number two uh, this is about the standard in Poor's 500 uh, will uh, decline below $100 disappointing investors number three financial stocks will have a rough time reversing the gains of 2012 uh, then number four talking all about this uh, US uh, and what all this means about the U United States becoming independent of Middle East oil imports before 2020 uh, the number five is how immigration policy in this next year is going to play out. Number six is how uh, how the Chinese economy is going to play out. He predicts the Chinese economy to grow at seven percent. Here's one I like. Number seven, climate change. Climate change will contribute to another year of crop failures resulting in grain and livestock prices rising significantly. Demand for grains in developing economies continues to increase as the standard of living in those economies rises. Uh, he sees corn rising to $8, wheat to $9, and cattle to a buck fifty. Uh, then he talks about inflation in number eight. Uh, number nine, the Japanese economy remains lackluster. And number ten, the structural, the structural problems of Europe will remain largely unresolved as the recession that began there in 2012 continues for another year. Okay, so there you go, guys. There is a roundup of six doomsday uh, prophet economists looking forward, letting us know uh, what to expect in the year 2013. And guys, I was going to uh, finish this rant with my friends in big oil, actually in big gas, on another story. But since I did not find the story on Yahoo News, I'm going to actually have to make an addendum rant uh, coming at you in one minute. Uh, so I will, in my upcoming addendum in one minute, I'm going to peek over there into the alternative media to see their look into the U.S. gas supplies that we can look forward to in the upcoming uh, years. But for now, I'm going to wrap up my weekly review of the mainstream media's economic meltdown roundup and uh, say bye, guys.